All right, so I, I think I'm going to start just because it's 5.10 and we get started on time. And as people filter in, uh, we'll just continue and leave the door open at least for the first five minutes. Uh, so I'm Sterling. Uh, I, I work at Runtime IO, uh, which is a company that provides management and monitoring systems for IoT deployments. Um, and I'm going to talk about Apache Minute, which is a real-time operating system effort that uh, is, it's very similar to the Zephyr effort that I think you've heard a lot about at this conference, uh, but perhaps with a little bit of a different take on certain things. Uh, so Runtime is, is one of the, the, the major contributors to Apache Minute here. Um, our background, uh, or uh, the background of a lot of people at Runtime uh, is in kind of large scale early IoT systems. So I worked at a company prior to this called Silver Spring Networks. And at Silver Spring, we, we deployed about 24 million uh, network street lights, power meters, uh, in kind of industrial equipment on large scale uh, sub gigahertz wireless networks. And our company was, was, was really founded because when you have all of these devices and these traditional assets that are networked, um, you want to do things like up, update software to those devices. And what we found is we ended up building those management systems by ourselves. And it seems like everybody who develops the, kind of one of those first gen IoT devices, whether it's us with, with power meters or Fitbit with wearables, ends up building their own management system. So that's kind of the, the idea behind runtime. Uh, I want to talk, I'm going to talk almost entirely about Minute uh, for this session, but just as a context uh, from, for where I was coming from. So uh, when we, we, we founded Runtime and we looked at, you know, okay, we want to provide this management system, we want to provide good software upgrade and secure software upgrade, we wanted to um, be able to let people know what was running on, a, on an operating system or if there was crashes in the field, we wanted to bring back core dumps to them. We wanted to, to manage these devices out there, but if you looked, there was a whole set of devices that ran Linux and were easy to manage and had standard kind of management APIs. And then the entire set of devices that didn't run Linux, so really if you think about it, Cortex-M series devices, you know, there's MIPS in that world and there's 8051, but anything that didn't have an MMU in it and wasn't powerful enough to run Linux, things were pretty much a mess, right? What, and what we did and what, and what most people do is they, if they have a, a kernel at all, they buy an RTOS kernel or they use something like free RTOS. And then they start to cobble together their own systems from there. So they'll either use a chip vendor provided bootloader or they'll write their own bootloader. They'll buy an IP stack from a third party IP stack vendor. And they'll essentially create and compose their own operating system for these devices. However, the problem, of course, is also in addition to that making everything non-standard. When you're writing your own flash file system and your, your goal is to get out a connected power meter, how much time are you going to spend writing that flash file system? Not a lot, right? And are you going to care about encrypting it first? Well, if that's not in the product spec sheet, you're not going to care about encryption to start with, right? Are you going to care about um, you know, error correction on flash? Maybe a little, but you're really focused on the first version of that product. And so what ends up happening is you have all of these kind of half-developed modules in your own operating system that you then, you're, if you're lucky enough that the first version of your product works, you end up having to scale that and grow that over time and live with those mistakes. And that ends up being really, really costly. In addition, it makes it hard to use third-party management services because what you've developed is very, very specific to your company and specific often to the hardware platform or the chip that you've chosen. Uh, and so it really becomes uh, kind of your own little walled garden that you live in. And so that was really the first, that was where it clicked for us, that there needed to actually be an operating system on the endpoint that was open source, that everybody used, that everybody collaborated on, so that we can, that, that provided consistency for us to provide management. And it also enabled these product companies who were developing connected products to not have and maintain their own operating system efforts. Uh, so that is the idea behind Apache Minute. So Apache Minute, uh, very similar to Zephyr in, the, in, in, in this scope, is uh, really an oper a, a more encompassing uh, uh, operating system for these devices. Where we differ a little from Zephyr is we do provide things like the bootloader for these devices as well as the upgrade and management schemes intrinsic to the operating system itself. You wouldn't typically see that in, for example, a Linux, but you know, when you look at Linux, there's a lot more uh, code space available and a lot more RAM space. 
and so you don't have to optimize things for it to be as small. So what, what's included in the minute system is everything down here from the bootloader itself. So we, have a secu so we have built our own build and package management system to actually build the operating system itself. That build and package management system allows you to create upgradable firmware images, to sign those firmware images, to locate them on flash, and then our secure bootloader actually understands uh, where images are located and can switch between different images. Uh, there's a flash file system built within Minute, so we support uh, FAT32, but we've also designed other flash access mechanisms for these small constrained devices. So we've designed our own log structured flash file system for very small flashes. So think, you know, a megabyte of flash with 128K blocks and you need to write a file system, and 16K of RAM, and you need to run a file system on that. There are, and in addition to that, there are other mechanisms for accessing Flash. So a lot of what people do is they don't run a full file system where you actually have uh, writes anywhere in a file, but they just run TLB configuration storage mechanisms. So we have Flash TLB mechanisms in there as well. On top of that, we have a preemptive multitasking real-time kernel, which I'll get into. Uh, this is nothing unique or different. It's just uh, licensed in there. Uh, the HAL itself. Is, uh, is our hardware abstraction layer in the operating system. So the HAL operates independently of the operating system and can be used in the, across the bootloader and the core of the device itself and is really designed as a purely a per peripheral abstraction because you have so many different variants of MCUs that people use and they, they do share a, a core set of peripheral functions. So that's what our HAL ends up doing. On top of that, we have the drivers and the power management infrastructure in the OS. So there, they, the, the difference between drivers and HAL is that the HAL is meant to be a complete implementation for every MCU. So you are guaranteed when you use this MCU that UART, SPI, I squared C are there and implemented and working. And, and we've designed those APIs to be as low layer as possible so that you can then build drivers on top of them. And drivers are meant to be where there's diversity in the system. So you can, you can write a driver for an ADC that uses DMA and is very complex or you can write a driver for an ADC that's very simple and just does a blocking read. Uh, but it, the implementation of that driver doesn't live in the MCU code itself. It's separate and comes along with the system. We tie in power good power management support throughout the operating system. So in addition to it being a tickless RTOS, all of the, drive, all of the HALs can, can start and stop peripheral APIs, and the drivers have a concept of suspend and resume so that when, you wanna, when the system goes to sleep, you can suspend a driver, and even if it's open, it will go into a low power state. Uh, there's hooks in the code for um, managing power domains and clock domains, and all of the things you kind of expect on, a more, on some of these more complex MCUs. You don't see that across the entire Cortex-M space. So for example, clock domains, you typically don't see on the smaller Bluetooth socks. You do definitely see, their on, see them on the higher end STM processors and NXP processors. So, you know, depending on the platform, we'll do different things there. Uh, but we do have APIs for both. And then there's a whole set of kind of embedded middleware that provides configuration management, software upgrade, all of the things you would need to do when you have a real product out in the field. And they're engineered into the system itself. Uh, followed by networking stacks, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit more detail. Uh, but, you know, when we looked at building an operating system, the, the thought was, okay, well, so where do you start, right? You have to make some, this is a very, very expansive effort, and you have to make something that works for a set of users who are building products if you want to kind of paint this vision. So the first area we focused was really on Bluetooth ener low energy connected devices. Uh, we chose Bluetooth because it's one of those protocols where, you know, if you're using an RTOS, you probably, or if you care about power, you're, you're probably using an RTOS in the extreme, and certainly most Bluetooth low energy devices use our tosses. Uh, so one of the major features of Minute and one of the areas where we've gotten a lot of uh, initial adoption is we have a fully open source Bluetooth low energy stack, both host and controller, uh, built for the NRF51 and the NRF52. Um, and the idea for us is really open source wireless networking stacks. And where we, at runtime at least, have spent a lot of our focus is not actually so much on the IP side of things, so I, as a contrast to Zephyr, I think they're implementing their own IP stack. Uh, we've, we've adopted LWIP, and we've integrated it into our system. And LWIP is, is very solid for us. 
Uh, but where we really put our focus is on the wireless side of things, because that's where we think the innovation actually needs to happen. IP has been there for quite a while. Although, if folks want to join the project and work on IP, we, we're, we're more than welcoming. Uh, and then there's security that layers on top of that. Uh, so another kind of core tenant of the operating system, and I'll jump into the, 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 the kind of the good stuff next, but just when it comes to how we run the effort, the idea is to be a community-driven operating system effort. So that, it, the, the contrast of that uh, to other efforts is really that no company or corporation has a board seat or owns the effort in any way. So we love companies to contribute. We certainly want anyone here who is at a com company to contribute and invite their friends. But the project is run by the committers on the project. So essentially the way it works in the Apache Software Foundation is if uh, you come on the project, you're, you're using Apache Minute and you find problems with it or you want to improve it in some way, you submit patches. If you submit three, four patches, you start to commit co to contribute to the community. You get uh, elected as a committer on the project and the committers elect other committers. And after that point, you then have a vote in the direction of the project. So there is no technical steering committee, there is no board uh, the, that is bought, there is no way to buy those seats. But it's really all about submitting code and building a community on the development list. And this is kind of the Apache way. So the Apache Software Foundation was founded in 1999 uh, to do the Apache web server. They've also done Hadoop and a, a lot of the larger big data efforts. And really they, they started by building the Apache web server. And then what they found was they had a scalable community model. And they decided to apply that to other projects. So every Apache Software Foundation project is run the, the same way. It's a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And we are just one of many members of the Apache community. Uh, so onto the RTOS itself. And I think I've talked a little bit about this. So when we looked at an RTOS, uh, kind of, you know, the, the core design decisions that came into the RTOS were, if you look at the kernel <laughs> itself, to make it simple and, and have an easy programming model. We've seen a lot of RTOSs over time from UCOS to ThreadX to a lot of these kernels. And they have you know, four different message passing APIs often. There are both cooperative and preemptive models in a lot of these RTOSs. There's a lot of things that allow you to be very specific about how you use them. What we decided to do was distill this down to a couple of, uh, of key elements. So we have ta the concept of tasks. Tasks are preemptive. Um, there is a, in the system, there is event queues. So pretty much on the next slide, I'll talk about the event-driven model, but pretty much everything goes through an event queue, which essentially allows you to sleep on a queue. And when there are events, wakes you up. So most tasks, what they do is they sleep on an event queue. Timers, I.O., everything is scheduled through those event queues. And then the operating system itself operates in a tick list mode. So you, just, you, you declare tasks by priority, uh, priority one being the highest, priority 253 uh, being the lowest priority. And the highest priority task runs until it can't run anymore. When it yields its context, lower priority tasks can run and so on. If a lower priority task is running, and you want to run a higher priority task, say you, you take an interrupt because you've received a packet. If you schedule the, the higher priority task as active, it's going to preempt the task below it. There are mutexes, semaphores, and that's pretty much the core of the kernel itself. In addition to that, we, we, we keep a few helper functions uh, in the operating system itself. So we keep a concept of unified buffer management. So we have something called mbuffs, which are very similar to Linux kernel SK buffs. So the idea that you have a, um, a unified buffering scheme, you can de declare certain size memory pools. And we really locate that in the kernel just because it's a very convenient place to put it. And we want all of the networking stacks and all of the system to share those buffers. And we've, we've engineered the entire system to share those buffers so that you can resize them to based upon your memory requirements. Uh, and then there's a fair amount of, uh, the, actually the other major thing in there is uh, high resolution timers. So our HAL, HAL interfaces abstract MCU level timers, but they deal in ticks because that's what pretty much every processor we've seen deals in. And we didn't want to uh, burden the HAL with the, comp, uh, with the conversion from ticks to, milli to megahertz. So in the operating system itself, we allow you to declare chained high, high resolution timers. 
And then the rest of the operating system is really focused on how do you manage this operating system. So we have memory debugging inter interfaces on the memory pools. Uh, we've built in a sanity task, which actually wa is a software watchdog that tickles the hardware watchdog, but also allows you to have checks on memory pools and on tasks waking up. Uh, we've built in um, resource utilization tracking to the operating system so you can see which tasks run, how often they run, how many, how many times they switch tasks. So it's really the majority of the effort and focus has been in making the operating system easy to, to debug. Uh, so this, this operating system right now works across uh, Cortex M0, M3, M4. Uh, we are actively working on M7 and somebody has submitted the first set of patches for MIPS. So those are the, the, the platforms we've targeted to date. Um, so event queues, and I'll, I'll jump over this quickly, but when we, when we focus on event queues, really the, if you look to the left here, essentially this is how an event queue is working, how an event queue works. And really we expect in most cases people to be using event queues. Sometimes you'll wait on semaphores as well. If you, if you want to have the concept of event flags where I want to wake up on a, on a flag if any of these bits are set, we do support that. But primarily the task comes up and it waits for an event from the event queue. This can either be IO, and like an incoming packet, it can be a timer, it can be a message from another task. And you wait from all of those operations, you execute and then you go back to sleep. The reason you want to program in this way is it allows the operating system to go to sleep and move the processor into sleep modes while you're waiting on the event queue. So the event queue marks that the task isn't ready to run. When the entire system goes to sleep, we're able to shut off the CPU. We essentially look for the next scheduled event. We shut off the CPU. We suspend all of the drivers. We allow for custom power management hooks in there. And so when tasks, you know, tasks can run if you want a low priority task that just always runs, that's perfectly fine and you can do that, but the system won't go to sleep if you do that. And so really the idea is that everything should run through these event queues, and these event queues have a bunch of debugging information built into them as well. So when you have core dumps or when you have crashes in the system, you can actually pull information about the event queues and what's been happening on a task. Um, so kind of going next on to connectivity layer. So where we've started, is over here, uh, where we really started our effort was on BLE 4.2. So we've implemented a Bluetooth controller for the Nordic stack. Uh, kind of some of the highlights are you get a lot of uh, Bluetooth connections. So by default, the soft device from Nordic only supports three connections in central mode, uh, one connection in peripheral mode. Uh, we've run up to 32 simultaneous connections in production. Uh, the, the addition to that is you also have some of the higher data rate features and just flexibility about how you configure the stack and, and run it. Uh, it's down to the controller level, which means we manage all of the radio things, and it's portable across trip sets. So we're porting that same controller to the NXP KW41Z and to other processors. What you see in a lot of the traditional MCU efforts is that people have chosen the, the specific networking stack provided by the chip vendor. And so when you want to switch or when you want to procure a chip, the problem that you have is, oh, it's not just that I have to retest the hardware. I have to retest the entire networking stack and all of the bugs I found in the Bluetooth stack and all of the things that I uh, worked around in the software up upgrade mechanisms. All of those change. And so it becomes a very large effort when you're switching between chipsets. When, when we implement out all of the uh, proprietary driver code that's been given by the chip vendors, that allows people who are developing products to then go procure across multiple chips. And they can choose on power and cost, which are the pretty much, power, cost, and size are the major reasons people will choose a chipset. Uh, above, above this layer, we have uh, two options here. Uh, one is Newt Manager, which is our own custom management protocol, and it's, it's very, very small. Uh, we use it for things like when we do our serial boot uh, to do software upgrade in the, directly from the bootloader or on some of the very, very small devices. But pretty much at the management layer, we've standardized on OIC. So OIC uh, it essentially runs on co-op. Uh, the standard itself actually has uh, six low pan and DTLS on top of GAT. We've removed that and we run directly on GAT. But the idea is that we think OIC can work across all of the different transports and can be a protocol that provides unified management and application layer traffic 
which is, which is a big deal on these constrained devices. Right? We, you don't want to have one framework and one set of security policies for your management stuff and then another framework and another set of security policies for your application stuff and have to deal with all of that extra code. And what's really nice about OIC is that it has profiles for Wi-Fi, it has profiles for VLE, and it's going to have those other transports over time. And so the same framework that we use for management can easily be adapted and used uh, for your application layer data. And a lot of people are using it. Uh, we've recently added Wi-Fi support. Uh, so for Wi-Fi connected socks, uh, this includes LWIP and TCP IP and TLS and DTLS. Uh, OIC works directly on top of the Wi-Fi interfaces as well as the Bluetooth. So you have the same API that you create those management commands works across both. And the same applies for the application layer commands we provide as well. Uh, in the future, we plan on implementing a whole set of new transports. Uh, of course, the project is open for anybody, and anybody who has a wireless transport that they're particularly excited about, uh, we're welcoming of it. However, the ones we, uh, I think at runtime, really think are going to be in our future is Bluetooth 5, which we think is great. Uh, the addition of mesh is going to open up a lot of use cases there. Um, and then we think that there's a lot of effort in low power wide area networks. That, that space tends to be a little bit more nascent, but we definitely like to see LoRa support in our operating system, as well as some of the things like 154G and, y, and um, YSUN there. And then, of course, uh, there's a lot of efforts in 3GBP like NB-IoT, which we think will take off a fair amount of the market as well. On top of that, we do plan on running uh, Thread on top of IPv6, uh, as well as the rest of the stack. And of course, you know, you don't have to run OIC. You can direct write an app directly on top of any of these things. It's really up to you. But where we've really spent effort optimizing and engineering the system is around the OIC protocols. Because we, as a part of every release, we test software upgrade, we test management, we actually use it for our operating system. Uh, so uh, some of the features here, I think we've covered a lot of them. Uh, the only thing I'd mention on the, the, the Bluetooth stack is not only do you have better performance as opposed to the other options, but because it's open source, you can actually configure it. So when you want to go peripheral only and you want to take out security and take out things and have the smallest possible implementation, you can do that as well as going full central mode and, and running it. So that's a nice feature of, of it being open source. And then uh, on Wi-Fi, the chipset we supported first is the Link 1500. Uh, there are efforts underway to support uh, other Wi-Fi chipsets. Specifically, we've been working on MediaTek, although we'd love Broadcom and a few others uh, if anyone wants. Uh, so uh, just jumping here a little bit and kind of some of the challenges in man maintaining connected products. So one of them. I think, and, and just to kind of go off, these are the, these are the uh, ways that Minute optimizes to solve these problems. So cross-platform support, as we mentioned, you know, what you re you, there's a couple of challenges here when you're developing a connected product. One is just bidding chip vendors against each other, right, which you definitely want to do. Uh, it, 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 it's amazing how uh, much less expensive the product becomes when there's competition. The other is that typically the old version of the chip has better software support for it. Uh, or has worse software support than the new version of the chip. So in a lot of cases, the next version of that chip will have all of the new features and the old version will just be supported when in fact you can have the old features running on the, or the new features running on the old chip. Uh, but there, there's obviously a reason that you want to upgrade there. So having an open source operating system that's cross-platform that implements things down to the hardware level really allows you to exercise price pressure on the, on the vendors. It's also something that you want to consider because as you go into higher and higher volumes, a lot of companies will typically do their own system on chips. I mean, that's where you see NEC, for example, having a ton of business. And so it's also the ability to then port to your own system on chip as you scale. Uh, software upgrade is another big item here. So the idea is how do you do secure software upgrades? So Newt itself is our build and package management tool. Newt will, has the concept of targets. So essentially, you have an a, a target consists of the application you're building and the board support package it runs upon. When you do that, Newt can generate a bootloader image, the bootloader itself for that platform. It generates a upgradable firmware image, and it can generate a manufacturing flash image. When it does all of those steps, 
When it generates the manufacturing flash image, it generates a SHA-256 of that flash image. It generates a flash map that gives you a picture of how the flash is laid out. So when your images come up, they can actually understand what version of flash they're running against. And it creates these upgradable software images that are, that are signed with either ECC or RSA. And the bootloader can check those options. In addition to that, what you see on a lot of the smaller Bluetooth system on chips, so Nordic as an example, is they only have 128K of flash, uh, sometimes 256. So what they do is they have in-place software upgrade. So the idea is instead of dual banking your image upgrade, you have an application in one sector and a kernel in the other sector. And then they, what they do is they'll basically erase your application, write the new kernel into your application sector, and then replace the kernel, and then write your application. So we support both options in the bootloader, both the dual banked approach as well as in-place firmware upgrades. Um, an image download works over Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and serial, as well as directly from the bootloader for preload cases like in a maker board. Um, Debugging is a huge uh, thing that you need to actually put effort into. So this is consistent logging and statistics infrastructure that can be compiled out at various levels. So not only do you want control over you know, what modules you're logging at what level and whether or not you enable those log entries to be written, where you want it to be configurable where they're written, either written to RAM or Flash or somewhere else. But you also want to make sure that, those, that that can be compiled out of your firmware image. So we've built in the logging infrastructure to the operating system, as well as the statistics infrastructure. So the majority of our debugging uh, at SilverSpring was done via statistics. We didn't have enough memory to actually count the logs. So when we missed a packet, when we were late on, on handling an interrupt, when we were doing any of these things, we would be counting statistics and then pulling those statistics back and graphing them. And then core dumps obviously are a huge issue. Most of these embedded systems don't have core dumps available for them. Uh, we can, you can either dedicate a flash sector to a core dump of memory. Uh, we, can, we, we, we dump it and alphify it and allow you to use it with GDB. Or we write it to the spare image slot if you're not using an, an image slot. And then kernel level support for stack guards, memory tracking, kind of all of the things you want running in the kernel while you're doing it. And you want that to be done for you. You don't want to engineer that yourself. And then finally, power management. And power management is, is largely hardware and, and project specific, but you want the hooks in the system that allow you to do the hardware specific things that you need to do. And so really, it's just finding the right places to hook into the kernel. Um, so I'm going to probably jump through this just, just given our time. But uh, I wanted to focus a little bit on the build and package management solution that we have. So we don't use make. Um, which disappoints some people. Uh, at, at the same time, the, the reason we designed our own build and package management system is because we wanted to be able to control the entire process of installing and, and reusing packages uh, to building a system to signing a firmware image and creating that entire system. So we've built our own build and package management si system called Newt. Uh, Newt does not yet, but will in the future, be able to generate a make file for those who, who miss make. Um, but it does a couple of things. One is it's composable. So the idea is that if you use Newt, packages just like uh, Node.js or Go, Package Manager, or any modern system, packages can be installed and reused. So the goal is, over time, that incubator minute core or minute core becomes the core of the operating system itself. But then people who want to do innovative things or want to have a faster release cycle can release packages on top of that, and people can install those packages. All of that is versioned uh, using Git. So we support uh, tracking tags, uh, upgrades, installation of multiple packages. One of the first areas I think we're going to do this is, is POSIX mapping. So we've had customers who have asked us to provide POSIX APIs for our OS. It's kind of insane to put that in the core because POSIX is way too heavyweight. But some of these processors are powerful enough that, that you can actually have POSIX on them. So we'll probably distribute POSIX support separately. And Newt allows us to do that. It also allows people to maintain their own internal code bases. So at, at, at previous companies, what we've done is we've had a platform team, which is really responsible for maintaining the operating system and the reusable components across many products. But then we stamped out individual products based upon that platform that we've developed. This, the build and package management system allows you to have the Minute Core and track to a specific version of Minute Core. 
to have your own internal platform team libraries and then to have per product instances of that and combine that all together. Uh, in terms of build, it's, it's a very uh, a standard build system. We support uh, parallel compilation. Uh, we support building multiple targets at the same time and having that. Um, uh, we support GCC primarily as the tool chain. We have not added uh, IAR support, uh, but the system itself supports multiple tool chains. Um, in addition to that, one of the benefits of owning the build system is the artifacts that you generate. So on every build, as an example, we dump the entire Git revision history that's along with that build. We create a SHA of all of the libraries and everything in the system so that we actually have an accurate picture of the source that's been built and when it's been built and all of the history that, that, that is from that image so that when you compile and you build a production image, you know exactly what was built and what, where it was built and all of that's with the image. We provide introspection features, so the ability to not only see what the size of objects are, but also to see what the size of various functions and symbols are. We have the build tool actually go and do that for you. And then there is this enforced hierarchy that we rely on from our build system. And so as an example, the hardware support packages are built into board support packages, which define you know, board level features, where pins are, what clock speeds are. And then we have MCU support packages that the board support packages will rely on. So NRF52, NRF NRF51, SAMD21 that we rely on. And the build system itself understands those dependencies and it understands the concept of a BSP in an application and has special rules for each of those. And then system definition and, and, and bundling of debugger support. So one of the biggest issues we always have is that Debugger tool chains seem to be maintained separately from the operating system support that runs them. So Newt has built-in support for connecting to a target, uh, calling out to OpenOCD, starting OpenOCD, making sure that JLink is bundled, making sure we have the debugger scripts supported for every single BSP. So when you actually go and use Newt on that particular board, you can debug it, you can load code on it, you can run it. And you can take that same image that you're debugging and you can create a downloadable software image and flash image from it. Um, so I guess, and I'll leave a little time for questions here. So on, on security, there's a couple of things we do. Uh, we've talked about signed firmware images and secure bootloader. Uh, we do have the ability to, you, to bundle security libraries and we do test security for the users of Minute so that you don't have to go and test DTLS or test TLS or any of those things. In addition to that, we also provide APIs for unique device identification. So you know, a lot of what happens when you manufacture these devices is you really care about having a unique ID. Uh, most system on chips these days actually provide unique IDs that you can leverage in the hardware. So we provide APIs for getting those unique IDs, uh, for generating private certificates using the unique IDs and random data, and then storing that in the system so that if you want to develop a provisioning system against this, you can do that. Uh, in terms of initial hardware support, so really we, we targeted Nordic as our first platform. So the idea was we really wanted to paint a picture of what the operating system should be. And we chose the NRF 51 and 52 to do that because we really like the chips. Uh, they're, they're the most popular broad market Bluetooth chip. They have uh, very good support and very clearly documented APIs for the chip, which is awesome. Uh, and so it really allowed us to, to go and build the operating system we wanted to build. Uh, but we also built against the ST Micro and Atmel platforms because we wanted to have a picture of how things looked separately as we were developing. Right? For example, the ADC between an STM and a Nordic, they don't look remotely similar. Right? Uh, STMs have clock domains, Nordics don't. Um, Nordic has this concept of a PPI where you can have multiple events get chained through the processor without waking up the CPU. You don't see that in all of the other processors. So being able to have multiple platforms that we worked on to begin with uh, was really important, uh, which is why we chose these two. But we really optimized for the vision uh, on the 51 and 52. So what's next? Um, next is more boards and more processors. So we've spent an excruciating amount of time uh, on our HAL APIs, which, don't, which is kind of miserable because you don't actually provide any additional functionality, but you keep rewriting the same code over and over again. Um, but we, we're, we're pretty happy with where the HALs have ended up. Um, so we're pretty happy with how the board support and MCU uh, structure actually ends up looking. 
So really the next phase, I think, on the project level is just to start expanding board support as dramatically as we can and really just implementing hundreds of boards and processors. Uh, and we, we welcome and, and hope for contributions. Um, we, we think that there's a lot of, if you're looking for kind of interesting problems, I think in the MCU space, the most interesting problems have to do with wireless networking. Uh, and so we're definitely going to be working on future wireless networking stacks and are looking for people to, to work on them with us. Uh, we are planning on adding Ethernet support because it's easy to add and uh, there are chips that do it. Uh, sem sensor APIs and sensor management is going to be another big area of focus uh, kind of post 1.0. So right now we have no APIs for sensors. We just have the HAL and the driver infrastructure in place. So as we expand board support, we're also going to be expanding sensor support uh, in the operating system and having good APIs for all of those. And then finally, you decide. You know, this is not my project. It's not Runtime's project. It's the contributor's project. And so if you want to add things to it, join the mailing list, submit patches, and you have an equal vote as anybody else. So more information is at minute.apache.org. Uh, feel free to join the, the development mailing list. That's where all decisions get made, all discussions happen. Nothing in the project happens without being discussed on dev. So if you want to have a picture and talk exactly where, where, where the state of things are, just join dev and jump in. So are there any questions before we? Yeah. Um, your Apache project, but you're not using the Apache license. Any specific reason why? We're using the Apache license. You said BSD. Oh, it's BSD, BSD like is what I said. Okay, fair yeah. It's <laughs> Apache 2 license. It's Apache 2 license for okay, everything. Problem solved. Uh -huh. question was, um, you mentioned DTLS and TLS. Did yeah. you write your own library or are you using a specific implementation? No, we were using embed TLS. Okay, and tiny, we, we, we import both TinyCrypt and embed TLS. Uh, we use TinyCrypt for parts of the Bluetooth stack because uh, it's a little bit smaller, uh, but then embed TLS for everything else. Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, it's platform specific. On the 51, which is the one we care most about, because um, it's by far the smallest, uh, we're about, if you, if you add it all up, including, uh, uh, including OIC support, we're currently all pretty much overflowing the space. Um, but we will optimize that down. We're about, without OIC support, we're about uh, uh, 9 kilobytes of RAM. Uh, it's a total of 16 kilobytes of RAM on the processor itself. And we end up being about 90K of code. Uh, we, we, we think we can get that down to about uh, 70K of code. Uh, you have to strip out like Bluetooth security and a few things there. Um, but we think we can, the footprint for kind of running the entire system with, with OIC will be about seven, between 70 and 80K. And the RAM won't get much better, but we will be able to bring uh, OIC in there. Without an IP stack, right? That's without an IP stack, yeah. The IP stack obviously makes it much bigger. Hooks? Yeah, I mean, it's an application, or it's kind of a power management service inside my unit? Uh, it's a couple of things. So there's a BSP power state call, which essentially per board support package, you implement power states, and we define a few set of uh, predefined power states, and then you can de de define your per user power states from there. So we have sleep, deep sleep, off, on, um, suspend. Better. Uh, it is, we provide the hooks, but the user is supposed to implement it. So, if I want to have power management support in my application, I have to deal with power management. The, the system doesn't deal with it. So, what the system does, uh, so the driver infrastructure themselves has suspend and resume in them. Uh, no, the driver, the guy who writes the driver, has to, of course, implement suspend and resume. And the idea is that one task could open and close a driver. And another task in the system is the one that could be putting it to sleep. And so you want to be able to suspend anything that's happening, save state. So when you wake up the system again, the, the task that has the driver open doesn't notice that anything's changed. So the, the, the drivers have hooks for suspend and resume in them. Uh, and we hope for all standard drivers to have implementations of suspend and resume. Uh, the BSP power state call, is, it's up to you to actually turn the system into the various power states. 
Um, so it's really just a framework for you to call that. Um, and then we provide one other hook in the system. Uh, we, we do clock domains for you. So, you know, uh, ports are, the, the HAL implementations map pins to ports. When ports are unused, we turn off the ports. Uh, we have reference counting on clock domains. So when the clock domain is no longer used, we turn off the clock domain as well. Uh, and then when you want to like move to, for example, a super deep sleep, the only real support that we add there is we allow you to locate code in specific areas of RAM because on a lot of these processors, um, you can, you, you know, the Nordic, for example, has 64K of RAM on the 52, but you can go down, I think, to 4K in the lowest RAM retention state. And what we do there is essentially allow you to have a function that basically operates. Um, it's the only function that gets called when you come out of deep sleep and you have a section of RAM that's retained. And then you really decide whether to reboot, re reboot the entire system. So there's probably smarter things we could do, but we thought kind of as a first cut implementation, like you might want to debounce de a button press as an example. So you have a little code that can come up, okay, the, has the button been pressed three seconds? If so, cause a full boot. If not, go back to sleep. And so those are the hooks we have today. Although if people want to improve that or if their suggestions were, we think it's important. <laughs> Uh, I think it was the entire system, but yeah, it, it was it was engineering something that was uh, allowed you to quickly build the operating system components. Okay, but would it, would it be possible? Let's say I'm already happy with my operating system for these kind of devices. Yeah. Would it be possible to, to use the bootloader for for another operating? System? Absolutely. In fact, uh, I think uh, our bootloader was demoed at a recent concert com conference where it was the bootloader for Zephyr. Uh, certainly not out of the project scope. Uh, we decided, uh, you know, personally to focus on 32-bit because it just made life easier and everything seemed to be 32-bit. But if somebody submitted a patch, so long as it didn't increase code size on 32-bit, we'd be fine. Okay, so you don't see any uh, blocker for that? No, no. It's just, it's been optimized for 32-bit, but... Yeah. Anything else? All right, well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.